Hospitals are dangerous places to be in. I'm sure you agree with me. Um, it's very odd because you have patients who come up to you in the emergency department and say, uh, can you check me in for a full body checkup? They come in for upper respiratory tract infection. They say, oh, by the way, let's check me in for a full body checkup. They speak of hospitals like hotels where right? you can come in and get a full body checkup and some luxuries and some care and uh, then check out. And even our administrators like to uh, speak of hospitals and check in and check out. But in reality, hospitals are dangerous places to, to be in. Um, perhaps I start by telling you a story. The story is true, but the details have been changed a little bit to protect the identity of uh, the people and myself. So, um, this uh, 75 year old lady comes to the emergency department. Um, she's got a history of pulmonary tuberculosis, she's got bronchiectasis, which is a scarring of the lung. And uh, so she says she's been spitting blood for the last three days. So uh, emergency department did the right thing, got her admitted to the ward. Uh, so in the ward, um, as usual, it's in most cases with spitting of blood, uh, gets admitted to the respiratory department. So all the diligent respiratory physicians do a thorough checkup and um, decided that she needs a bronchoscopy. She goes for a bronchoscopy. And during the bronchoscopy, uh, they saw a little bit of blood in one of the lower airways. Nothing to be alarmed about. Uh, wasn't actively bleeding. So she goes back from the bronchoscopy, goes back to the ward. It's about 6 p.m. So let's have dinner. So the relatives come around. She's a bit drowsy, you know. It's quite concerning to us. Calls the enrollness. The enrollness comes and says, it's okay. She's just come back from uh, bronchoscopy. That's post sedation effect. It's all right, she'll wake up. So, um, Relative, wait for a while and then goes home. 7 p.m. and Ronas comes around again. Say, oh, she's still not waking up. Let's say, set of parameters. So, um, heart rate was about 110. The spirit rate was about 20. So, um, you think too much of it. Calls the staff nurse. Staff nurse, busy selling medications. Got another nicotine fracture somewhere. Got another patient appendicitis somewhere. Says, ah, I'll check it in two hours' time. I'm going to get some OT chips sent off, prepare some patients for all. Uh, she's just waking up from bronchoscopy and sedation. So she waits two hours, comes back, checks the parameters, heart rate is 125, respiratory is 25. Patients slightly awake, but um, uh, not terribly talkative at all. So the nurse thinks, hmm, maybe I'll check another hour later. So she comes back next hour, heart rate is 130. Respiratory rate is 28. Uh, saturation is fine, by the way. Saturation is 98%. So all is good. Calls the house officer at night. Now it's already 10 p.m. House officer has got another 20 more cases to clock. <laughs> <laughs> Emergency departments calling about some guy with low anotropy. Another <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's an it's emergency department with us home. Anyway, so, so the uh, house officer says, um, okay, give me, give me half an hour, I'll come around. So the house officer comes around at 11.30 again. Um, okay, heart rate is 130. Let's give some fluids. It's got no us home, so let's give some fluids. So give a little fluid, walks away. So the little fluid takes an hour to get in. So it's 12 midnight. Uh, the nurse takes the parameters again. Now the heart rate is 125. Respiratory rate still 28. Um, didn't think too much of it. Maybe the doctor's already ordered something. So let that fluid take effect. So everyone goes to sleep. The, the patient, the nurse, and the doctor. <laughs> and then 5 a.m., cardiac arrest. So the, the patient had a cardiac arrest at 5 a.m., uh, 8 is 30. That's good, CPR, good death, uh, not hyperventilated, uh, and gets to the ICU. And she goes to the ICU, reaches the ICU, does the usual blood work. Hemoglobin drops from 10 to 4. And um, subsequently has another cardiac arrest, promptly the next one hour, and this time uh, the patient couldn't make it. Goes for a post mortem, 
and autopsy shows esophageal erosion with the bleeding gastric ulcer. So that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that there is a chain of events. If you can recognize that chain of events, very often we see the ICU event, we see the cardiac arrest event, but we don't see the chain of events that led to it. And we know that cardiac arrest uh, happens everywhere. In fact, someone once said that it's probably easier to have a cardiac arrest outside the hospital and get saved and brought in than have a cardiac arrest in the hospital. As high as 35% of all adult in hospital cardiac arrest in general wards. 11% in A&E, 45% ICU obviously with various situations, but 35%, a third of that happened in the general ward. And a third of inpatient cardiac arrest. Now there's some talk that inpatient cardiac arrest have a slightly different, different profile from the out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, being a bit more complex, multiple medical issues. but. Having said that, subsequent uh, attempts to resuscitate these patients could have been prevented. This comes from, a, from a, an audit paper from, uh, from the Royal College of Anesthetists in uh, 2012. But what's more important is they found that in 47% of them, the patient assessment was deficient. Deficient at some levels, in the emergency department, during clocking and the initial assessment in the ward. And then there were warning signs of deterioration in almost 75% of cases. Patients become a little bit more tachycardic, a little bit more breathless, a little bit looking unwell. And then warning signs were not recognized in about a third of them. And even if they were, almost more than half of them were not acted upon. And even if they were, more than half were not communicated to the senior doctors, meaning they did not have appropriate treatment. So there's failure on a few levels. Failure to recognize, failure to monitor, failure to treat appropriately, and failure to rescue. So this, this uh, overall um, comes to this conclusion from the paper that there was a lack of input from senior clinicians in the 48 hours prior to a cardiac arrest, and these are unplanned cardiac arrests. But obviously senior clinicians cannot go on call. <laughs> and senior clinicians cannot be in the ward all the time. So it really depends on, on uh, a good doctor. But um, are you going to let your Next of kin, your relative in the ward, depend on chance. If he has a good doctor on that day, he'll be saved. If he doesn't, then it's up to the luck of the draw. So all it all it, it comes down to the chain of command. Um, in, in the traditional medical model, we go by the chain of command. Patient goes sick, see by enrollment, not going well, goes to the staff nurse. Still not going well, goes to the health officer, will be first day post. MBTS graduate. Um, do well goes to a medical officer, resident who could, could be doing a surgical posting, but uh, uh, emergency department or ENT training. Goes, after that, it goes up. So, with many places or many institutions have analyzed this, and people find there's almost a six hour, sometimes even a 24 hour delay before someone actually gets uh, appropriate treatment. And even if they get saved and they go to ICU, they become what we call unplanned ICU admissions. And unplanned ICU admissions have high hospital mortality. And, and it's been analyzed elsewhere, and we, and we looked at our own data. Uh, the blue ones are planned. I'm sorry, this, the first bar is planned, and the second bar is unplanned. And the, the blue ones are patients who die, and the green ones are those who live. And almost more than half of those who come into the ICU in an unplanned way will not make it out of the hospital alive. So even if you do rescue them uh, and you get to the ICU alive, they may not leave the hospital alive. Now let me introduce you to three, three gentlemen here. Um, maybe some of you may recognize. This is um, Michael DeVita. This is uh, Ken Hillman. And this is Renata Bilomo. They are, they are three um, people who are uh, at the forefront and most responsible for pushing the concept called rapid response or medical emergency team. Um, and I had the privilege of working with um, Renaldo Bonomo in uh, Melbourne to uh, learn about medical emergency team and rapid response system. In fact, it's become a science in itself. There are textbooks on it, and there are international conferences and symposium on rapid response system in its 10th year. It's a science in itself, rescuing people in the ward uh, from unexpected cardiac arrest. And 
uh, it's so well received that um, in 2005, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, Health Administration had this Saving 100,000 Lives campaign in which the key or first recommendation, I'm sure you can't see this, but it says deploy rapid response teams in the wards. That was the very first recommendation in 2005. And from then onwards, the subsequent campaigns going into what is called protecting 5 million lives from harm uh, develops that recommendation to have systems to rescue people in the world. It sounds odd that why do people in the world need rescue? Shouldn't they have already been rescued when they got admitted for emergency department? No, it doesn't quite end there. Uh, people need to be rescued continuously. Unfortunately though, is this concept of rescuing people from the war with, um, with uh, medical emergency teams and rapid response teams is difficult to study. Uh, when they looked at, uh, or rather there are very few studies that looked at this, and in one major study, or perhaps the only major study, uh, looking at hospitals in a clustered randomized control fashion, um, and randomized hospitals in Australia to those having a medical emergency team and those that do not, uh, at the end, they found that um, the number of uh, activations actually increased, but it did not make much difference to the amount of cardiac arrest or unplanned ICU emissions or unexpected death. And in fact, in, in certain reviews, uh, it did say that the evidence for this is quite weak. And, and uh, as usual in any uh, sort of concept, there are believers and are disbelievers. The disbelievers will pull scientific uh, evidence to, you know, using statistical analysis to say that it doesn't work. But uh, there are comments that say that um, if you do not have enough cardiac arrest in the world, you will not get uh, a statistical signal at all. So to have an effect, you need to activate the team enough. You need to have a significant number of cardiac arrests before the effect is being shown. So, um, at least in, in the scientific uh, statistical analysis point, uh, it doesn't have that much uh, evidence to back it up. But it's a bit like someone telling you, you know, if someone's deteriorating a ward, let's not save him. Because there's no evidence that saving him will make a difference to the amount of cardiac arrest in the hospital. Let's let things go on naturally. So it's hard to explain to someone that it's actually a, not really ethical anymore to, to conduct such a trial. But we are fortunate that um, uh, at least the leadership in this hospital believes in it. Uh, and uh, we have we've had a medical emergency team for the last uh, five years. Um, and uh, it is a culture change. It's a culture change because uh, now the uh, staff in the ward are empowered to call uh, this team. The team that the, the people that form this team are actually um, residents, senior residents and fellows, registrars. Uh, with uh, acute care uh, training, including emergency medicine registrar to join our roster to run this, uh, together with an uh, ICU nurse and a respiratory therapist. Uh, they get caught by a set of calling criteria, which um, is not, it's not rocket science, it's airway, breathing, circulation, seizures. All and as and I always tell this to, to, the, to the junior staff, if you cannot remember any of this, it's all right, because we have a, a criteria for others, which is uh, actually any patient that a staff member is seriously worried about that does not fit the health criteria. <laughs> so, and and there's, a, there's a very important statement in this poster. The statement says, there is no wrong activation and you will not be judged or penalized. So, we had nurses who activated us, junior nurses, senior nurses, the matron of the hospital. We've had junior doctors, senior doctors, all the way the heads of the departments who activated us. So there's really no, no shame or, 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 um, or blast to anybody's ego. And we put uh, cards on, on blood pressure machines, uh, pocket cards, stickers on telephones, just to tell people that help is available if you need them. Do not let your patient get into a cardiac arrest. In fact, having a cardiac arrest in the ward is not the norm anymore. Uh, it's not uh, a statistic that you want to collect. So people do not admit their next of kin to the wards to have a cardiac arrest, right? So it's a totally different profile that we're talking about. Uh, and just to prove that 
if you do analyze it, it does work. Uh, over the years, as the number of activations go up with uh, you know, acceptance of the culture, the percentage of uh, ICU emissions go down. So uh, overall, I guess this is what administrators like to see. But uh, there is a real uh, patient effect. Uh, the, the nurses, the ICU team all comment that patients now come to them in, in better state, better resuscitated, we forget our last one, be better uh, uh, ventilated, um, with enough uh, uh, resuscitation tools all done, and they do have a better mobility as they reach the ICU and eventually get out of the ICU. So, overall, uh, the logic says that this is something that works. The statistics and the science doesn't quite support it. Um, I've had, I had the uh, nice time writing a review for for uh, what is called the MET or MET syndrome. Um, I won't bore you with the paper, the paper is too long. Uh, but uh, the, the first few sentences of the paper say this. All truth passes through three stages. First is ridicule, second is violently opposed, and third is accepted as being self-evident. So I think we're, we're still somewhere in, in the second part where it's still violently being opposed. Uh, not in this hospital though, we, we, we generally quite um, uh, welcome it a lot. Uh, if you talk to any of the nurses in this hospital, uh, uh, they'll tell you a lot about uh, the medical emergency team. But sadly, it's still not um, something that's uh, prevalent in Singapore. I'm sure it's in Australia and in the US, um, but not in Singapore. In fact, um, it may be tapped on to what we call a cultural difference. The culture of, of uh, nursing and clinical and medical in uh, Singapore is still very much a hierarchical culture. Uh, it's quite different um, where uh, the doctor can do anything he wants. Uh, so it's quite different. Um, I still remember when I, uh, when I was working in, in Melbourne and uh, as a fellow, uh, I had a lanyard on with the hospital tag on it and, my, and who am I? I had a stethoscope around my neck. I was carrying a, a file or form, it's all with the hospital's logo on it, so I walk to a patient uh, to, to talk to the patient, the nurse stops me and says, who are you? And I was wearing all this thing that says I'm from the hospital, so, who are you? Why are you, why are you touching the patient? So I, it caught me by surprise because I thought that would never happen in Singapore. But uh, just to show that the, the culture is really different uh, uh, in, in Singapore, where uh, sometimes uh, nursing staff or junior staff are quite afraid to speak up. So this um, mechanism actually uh, helps to overcome all this in, uh, with the effect and in focus to the patient rather than to uh, um, escalation and delayed escalation. So um, hopefully um, we, we want to see this happening in more hospitals in Singapore. Uh, and perhaps around the world in the region, uh, where patients do get rescued after they get admitted to the hospital. Uh, and hopefully the next patient has a bronchoscopy for the wrong reasons, having a erosive uh, or eroded esophagitis and a gastric ulcer may be safe this time round um, at the point before the patient enters the ICU. So with that, uh, thank you. I didn't get a chance to show you the equipment we have. We, we have a dim sum trolley where, where when it's activated, you push a dim sum trolley there. The dim sum trolley has a um, defibrillator with a uh, pacing. It's got the um, V-scan portable ultrasound. Uh, yeah, probably should get a pass on. You can do anotropy on the patient. Um, it's got some um, um, a back valve mask with timer so that you don't hyperventilate the patient. So we've got a couple of uh, fancy gadgets. Can I just make an observation? Um, it's fairly critical of the Australian system. Uh, even though you said nurses aren't afraid to talk to doctors, what we found in our MET system, we've had it for about eight years, is that the nurses will call the MET. The resident goes, he sees the patient, but doesn't act appropriately. He doesn't stop the problem. But then, when there's another net call again, the resident again goes, it doesn't act appropriately. 
So we introduced this step called escalation, but your first mentor or rapid response, okay, the resident. If there's a second one within four hours, it has to be the registrar. If there's a third one within eight hours, it has to be the consultant. Since we did that, that bottleneck between resident and registrar and senior grade has eased out. And I think that the cultural differences in Singapore and Asian culture generally between residents and senior clinicians, that step I would strongly commend to overcome the saving face problem. I, I, I totally agree that the medical emergency team is as good as the people who run it. So if the people who run it are, are junior, you get junior input. And like what you said, they have to add an extra level of delay to what is already a delay. So yes, we, we, uh, that's exactly a, a good point. Um, on average, we have about uh, 25 to 30 activations a month. So um, we have not come to that point where a person gets met activated three times. So, but if, if we do come to that situation, that will be something that we really want to look at. So, uh, it really depends on how early the activation happens. If activation happens late, then you get more ICU admissions. If the activations happen early enough, and you can actually uh, put interventions to make the patient stable, they stay in the ward. So, as, a, as, a, as time goes on and the culture changes, people start to call the net team earlier and earlier. And so, in the initial years, we just have to perform the role of a uh, 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 um, transport team. We just brought the patient to ICU. We call us, we bring the patient to ICU. We call us again, we bring the patient to ICU. But three to five years down the road, they call us and go, okay, just a little time to try to see me. So they are like, close and it's okay. Or if you just need a bit of non invasive activation for a couple of hours, then it's okay. So after five years, things have progressed. So it this intervention takes years. If you do study where you are, you will not see any result in one month, nor six months, nor even one year. It takes three years, maybe five years, maybe even more. 